Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro, the Director of Portfolio Management here at Tricom. As an administrative and financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series, designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Diane Geller with Fox Rothschild LLP. Diane provides strategic general counsel services to a wide array of private and public companies, large and small, with a particular focus on the staffing industry. She offers informed and experienced guidance on business and employment law issues, including compliance with state and federal workplace regulations and a myriad of corporate matters. Fox Rothschild LLP is a national law firm that delivers strategic, practical solutions for a wide range of clients. Home to more than 800 attorneys in 22 offices coast to coast, Fox offers clients a team of bright, creative, accomplished professionals in 60 practice areas who excel at crafting legal solutions with a service-oriented, can-do approach. At the time of a presidential administration change, the incoming president makes personnel changes on the basis of their support for the president's policies and initiatives. In the business environment, this could mean significant regulatory changes. In today's edition of the Industry Insider webinar, Diane will cover the anticipated changes to employment law under the Trump administration, including immigration, healthcare, budget, recent legislations, marijuana legalization, cybersecurity, and more. By the end of this session, you'll know how the new administrative ad initiatives could impact your staffing business. If you have questions during the presentation, you can utilize the Q&A feature or um, the chat feature. And after the presentation, there will be time for some questions uh, and an opportunity for you to give us feedback on today's uh, webinar. Please welcome Diane. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I think that this is such an ever-changing and evolving situation with President Trump that this webinar, which was updated only a couple of days ago, is already trending to be out of date. And I think that's what we're seeing uh, with the change from the new administration. Uh, the good thing is, is that we're seeing the administration changing away from heavy regulation and much more significantly into a attitude of mediation. Um, in that regard, let me just start with, I don't know how many of you have seen and had the opportunity to enjoy the uh, movie Dave, uh, which is all about a temporary help, the owner of a temporary help company. So let's start with a clip. Oops. Okay, well, I'm hoping that you were all able to hear that clip and it, it shows what you probably all go through every day in terms of uh, uh, dealing with uh, temporaries and trying to get people out in the field. Um, Dave, who later goes on to provide services as a temporary president, uh, because he happens to look just like the president, the then president of the United States, 
and we'll pick we'll pick up with Dave a little bit later in the presentation. Um, with respect to immigration, I think those of you that are dealing in H-1Bs should know that the premium processing has been suspended effective in April, uh, and they're anticipating that to go on for about six months. The travel ban, which was um, previously blocked by the Fourth Circuit, uh, has already been uh, reinstated at least partially uh, by the Supreme Court, and more than likely by the time the court um, goes back in session later this year, it'll already be a uh, fait accompli and will not even be, need to be reviewed again by the court. Um, there are some, uh, some restrictions that were lifted, and when they put it into a place as a partial uh, ban, they allowed people with jobs in the U.S. to come back in and to enter which I think is primarily was affecting many of my clients. In terms of the Form I-9, the big issue here is whether or not you were using uh, electronic I-9s for the period November 14th through 17th in 2016. If you were, there was a Social Security number glitch and uh, you need to go back and take a look at those forms. If you have an incorrect form in that there was a transposition of the uh, number, you need to go ahead, draw a line through the transposed Social Security number in Section 1 and enter the correct Social Security number and then initial and date the change. Um, you should also attach a written explanation as to why the correction was made if you're ever audited. Um, that's basically how you correct I-9s regardless in terms of if you have an issue with them. Okay, the National Labor Relations Board is an interesting place that we've had some very interesting decisions come out over the last several years. Um, at the time of this slide, the president still had two appointments left. He's since made those appointments. And the good thing is, is that the appointments that he's made are very pro-employer. Uh, uh, so what we will hopefully start to see is some backing off of some of the very heavy negative restrictions that existed relative to such things as uh, handbook policies. So we're, we're very hopeful and optimistic. Uh, the one thing that's going to slow down seeing any changes uh, positive changes for employers for a little bit of time is the fact that the general counsel of the NLRB, uh, Mr. Griffin, the uh, term does not end until October of 17, and he is not able to be replaced until that time. So it's expected that once October rolls around, they will be a new general counsel to the NLRB so that the interpretation should be uh, much more uh, positive and management focused. Uh, one other thing to uh, know is that the NLRB had taken some very negative positions as to enforcing arbitration agreements in uh, employee uh, agreements, and that basically uh, that was shutting off the ability to limit collective actions. That's already started to be reversed, and that's a very positive thing for employers. Okay, in terms of OSHA, that too is changing as we speak. Um, the president had already repealed the OSHA law with regard to maintaining uh, accurate records. It was called the Volks Rule, and in fact, it had extended the ability of the agency to go back for five and a half years instead of just six months, which is for the original policy. So that's actually another very positive thing. While you have retention obligations, it means that you don't have to uh, be subjected to somebody coming back and hitting you with a paperwork error going back five and a half years. Um, the other thing that both OSHA and I recommend is that in agreements that you're writing with your clients, that you make the effort to specify who's got responsibility for what. So the, while you might have, as a staffing company, general safety and health training, 
you really need to put some of that responsibility clearly back on your client in the contract. And you might even think about having some type of an indemnification clause that talks about uh, the client indemnifying you if he fails to provide the training. Uh, you will, as the employer of the, of the uh, temporary, get hit with a, potentially get hit with a um, fine, but you can pass some of that on to your, to your clients if a well-drafted agreement is used. Um, because it is also, by the way, both jointly, jointly the staffing company and the client company are responsible for a safe environment. So that's where the uh, fines come in as against the staffing company. There's also been a new rule about electronic submission of incident reports, and that is being backed up in terms of not going into effect as originally anticipated. Um, I really don't know what to say about the American Health Care Act. As we all know, that's really sitting in Congress right now. Uh, we expected to see a vote before the 4th of July. That's now not going to happen. It's uh, being revamped yet again before it's uh, put before the Congress for a vote. Uh, I think that some of the interesting points is that they do think that the um, new act would reduce the federal deficit by about $119 billion over 10 years. Uh, and despite the fact that there may be a repeal of the Obamacare and this new American Health Care Act, um, there are many employers who aren't going to alter certain health benefits if it's repealed, if the ACA is repealed. Things like unlimited lifetime benefits, um, more than 50% of employers intend to keep that in place. Contraceptive care uh, is another one that they're intending to keep in place. Um, and the uh, age 26 dependent coverage. The majority also intends to keep that in place. Diane, could you try um, increasing the volume here on the screen at the bottom right-hand side of the video clip? I am not see. Uh, I don't see that. If you hover over at the bottom, I think it should appear. Okay. Oops. No, I just lost oh, it. one. We back back up. Yeah, go back to that slide. Yeah, I can't back up. I'm sorry. It's not backing up for me. Do you want to go ahead and take control? Back me up? And maybe you can make it. Ah, there it is. Okay. Let's try Thank that. Thank you. Hoping people can hear this. Well, as you can see in that clip, um, there's being some creative, uh, creative budget cutting going on, and I think that's also what uh, the president has indicated in terms of putting through a 21% budget cut for the Labor Department, 
Uh, he's discussed the, the potential merger of the, it should say, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance uh, with the EEOC. Um, some of you that do government uh, contracts have dealt with the Office of Federal Com Contract Compliance. Um, there's also an issue about the paid sick leave and the paid parental leave program. So the Obama had had uh, President Obama had passed a executive order mandating sick leave for federal contractor employees. We don't think at this point that that's going to be reversed by the Trump administration, and it's kind of taken a little bit of a backdoor. Um, of uh, back to seat with respect to uh, the other initiatives. Uh, there are those of you that are from around the country know that paid sick leave is beginning to take off in various states and even down to the level of various um, uh, counties. Uh, it's very difficult to keep up with. If anyone on the phone is from Illinois, you know, for instance, Illinois has a, has a paid sick leave. Chicago has a paid sick leave. Cook County has a paid sick leave, all of which are slightly different. And now we have counties within or, or sub, subdivisions within Cook County who are opting out of the Cook County program. So it's a little, uh, a little tough to keep up with. There are uh, both their local paid sick leaves in North and South Carolina, uh, Alabama, Georgia, uh, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, and several other states. And then there are actual paid sick leave requirements by state in, in uh, states such as Arizona, California, and a couple of others, and Washington, D.C. In terms of the paid parental leave program, uh, they've, the Trump administration has allocated $20 billion uh, towards this national program. The thought is that's going to run through the state's unemployment insurance infrastructure. We really don't know what that's going to look like yet and whether that's going to increase your unemployment rates or whether it's going to be funded sort of the way, for instance, New York State has a, I think New Jersey also have state disability plans, uh, which is an insured program. Uh, that both the employer and the employee contribute into. Uh, so it may be that. It's just too soon, unfortunately, for me to give you any real uh, clear-cut uh, information. We do know, though, that there are some other locales that are starting to pass paid leave, family leave law, like New York. And now they're talking about having it as a, um, how it's going to be paid, I think, is still being debated. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, I know we were all watching in anticipation the statute that was supposed to take effect or the regulation that was supposed to take effect on December 1 of 2016. Um, it was really a false start for many people. There are many companies that actually implemented the uh, new regulations, which would have called for a quite a substantial increase, more than doubling what the um, base uh, salary, required salary for an exempt employee. Uh, there was a lot of scurrying around looking at definitions of exempt versus non-exempt employees and trying to figure out how to meet the 47476 uh, wage for uh, base salary. Well, that's been stalled by an injunction in Texas, and it actually looks as if the Department of Labor is not going to pursue it. Uh, there are some uh, union groups that are looking to try and speak on behalf of the statute of uh, the regulation, and it remains to be seen what's going to happen. Uh, certainly, until a decision's made, you can continue uh, at the current salary level. Uh, you should go back, though, and relook at updating your job descriptions and make sure that it meets one of the white-collar exemptions. Uh, for if usually in, in the temporary uh, arena, it's your in-house people, but you need to go back and take a look at it. This is a good time to do that. Um, they're opening a new period of public comment 
and the new Secretary of Labor, um, Acosta, basically has been has been saying that the 23660, which is the current base salary uh, for an exempt employee, is way too low. But he's also said that the 47476 is way too much. So I I'm anticipating we're going to see something in between, and uh, we're all waiting waiting for that to happen. Uh, there's also been some movement on the joint employment and the misclassification of employees. Uh, there's been a little bit of a change in course by the Department of Labor in terms of joint employment, independent contractors. And what that means is that under President Obama, the Department of Labor took the position that most workers should be treated as employees rather than independent contractors for minimum wage and overtime. So there's been a little bit of a, a, a backing off of that interpretation uh, in terms of having been revoked by the Department of Labor. Uh, the Department of Labor is likely to take a more limited approach on the interpretation of joint employment. However, in the staffing industry, we and our clients cannot eliminate the joint employment obligation. However, we need to help our clients understand how to manage that issue because it can't be eradicated. So it's a big educational situation with clients, talking about operational practices, um, and I think that it still can be managed, but it's not going to be eradicated. Um, the new labor sector secretary prefers dealing with direct and immediate control standard and joint employment as opposed to the other standard that the prior group, the prior administration had been using. And that even goes back to the issues of um, uh, you may have all heard about the McDonald's case where the franchisor was being held responsible for the acts of his franchisee just by virtue of some of the general policies that passed. We're going to be backing off of that position. Um, in terms of your expectation as an employer, you need to keep, um, keep complying with the Fair Labor Standards Act the way it exists today. Um, it's hard to believe that wage and hour litigation is still on the rise, but it is. Uh, the, the prior administration had, uh, the Department of Labor had initiatives that encouraged claimants to proceed with lawsuits. Uh, in fact, they had, had launched a national campaign that was intended to inform workers about their workplace rights. I think we're going to see some backing off of that. Um, we're going to see much more conciliation instead of litigation. Most of the claims for are uh, under the litigation still are the unpaid work time and misclassification of workers. Um, I have a couple of cases in the office that deal with the professional day and professional week, and um, you know that's just uh, a question as to whether it was a mistake, and in most cases it was the way it was managed. Uh, comes down to most temporary employees need to be paid for each hour that they work um, unless they come within a particular exemption. You've got to look at the overtime obligation. Um, when these cases happen, you've got to make a determination as to whether to settle or fight. Unfortunately, most cases end up having to be settled because if you lose by a dollar, you're paying the legal fees of the claimant or of the plaintiff. So most cases end up being settled. And the way that you protect yourself is that you, you make a point of doing it right. You go back, you audit what you're doing, you make sure the timesheets are correct, that they're being uh, signed, that they're being paid uh, correctly, and overtime is being paid so that you're not allowing any off-the-clock hours. This is really, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is what's implicated when you're doing background checks. If you're using a third-party background company, um, you need to comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, even if it's just getting, if it's not getting a credit store and it's just getting, for instance, a criminal background check. And this is now becoming the new lawsuit du jour of the day. Um, because it has some very specific requirements under it, 
And if you don't follow the specific requirements, then once again, this is a lawsuit that plaintiff's lawyers are looking to take and to collect their legal fees from your pocket. Um, in terms of if you are not using the, a third party, so if you're not using, for instance, a background check and you're just having your, uh, one of your employees go online and look up people's criminal backgrounds, then that's not going to implicate the Fair Credit Reporting Act, but I think most companies are, in fact, using a third party to do this. So the, the big issues come into having a permissible purpose, which doing a background check is a permissible purpose for placement. Uh, if you were doing financial credit checks, there may be a question about that. Uh, in order to do, though, the background check, you really you have to have a disclosure and a written authorization. And that is very critical as to what is in those documents. Um, and then, of course, you need to take a two-step two -step adverse action, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Many of you who use the third-party uh, background check companies have received copies of their certification that they want you to have your temporary employee sign or your uh, internal staff employee sign before they will pull a background check. You need to make sure that those are in compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So things that you need to have in that, in that document, and there's a question as to whether you can, com you can combine a permission with a disclosure, and it's probably safe or not. Your the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires that you notify in writing and obtain the consent of the applicant before you order the background check or before taking an adverse employment action based on the result of the background check. Um, you must provide new and updated notices to your applicants and your employees, so make sure the uh, notices you're using are up to date. And those disclosures have to be in a standalone document. Um, you can get written authorization, has to be obtained before you order the background check. And once again, there's been a lot of litigation, and where it's coming from is over extraneous information in the disclosure. So many staffing companies have kind of mushed this all in with other kinds of releases and other kinds of uh, uh, disclosures, and you can't do that. It's got to be standalone. It's got to be uh, clearly following the rules under the Fair Credit Reporting Act because that's where the language is being challenged. If the authorization is too broad, you fail to provide the summary of rights. Um, so that's very, very important. Sharing of reports. Many of you probably have clients who want to see copies of the reports. So that's a very risky business under the Fair Credit Reporting Act unless you have uh, the proper permission from your temporary employee. So, or your candidate. So those of you that are sitting someplace that you can write this down, and if you can't, if you, my email address is available at the end of this, um, email me and I'll be happy to send it to you. But what you want to be saying when you're turning this over, uh, when you're having your temporary or your staff employee uh, provide uh, permission to share the report is that the information, here's, here's what I would like to see, the information gathered by the company and any consumer reports and or investigative consumer reports may also be shared, may also be communicated to other companies where you may be eligible to be staffed or employed based upon your qualifications. I know that was a lot to, uh, to give you in one little reading, so as I said, if you contact me, I'll happy, be happy to send you an email with it. You don't, the other big issue is, and there was just recently a case against a staffing company, is that you do not want to comment on the contents of the report if you're going ahead and sending it to your client. So you, the language there you probably want to use is, Attached is a consumer report prepared by whoever. Please note that your company name had no involvement in preparation of this report and is passing it on to you merely as an administrative service. Uh, the case that involved the staffing company was a recruiter making a comment 
on the uh, report, and that then uh, created a litigation. You, you also, the big, other big issue has to do with this two-step adverse action. Most of you have forms, I'm sure, for that. You need to make sure it's done in two steps. You've got your pre-adverse action, and then you got to give them a little bit of time to comment back as to whether it's correct or not, and then you do your adverse action letter. Um, and that is also um, when you when you send out notice after you take an adverse employment action, you have to tell them that they're rejected because of the report. One of the big problems that we're seeing is that recruiters are calling before the adverse action letter, uh, staffing companies are not sending the two letters, and they're doing some type of an automatic rejection letter that doesn't comply. So compliance, 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 otherwise you're open for litigation. Um, Moving along, the EEOC, um, once again, we're seeing more focus now on conciliation rather than litigation. Uh, the new EEOC retaliation guidance has requiring three steps, that there was the protected activity, the adverse action, and the causal connection. Uh, there's it, They're switching over some of the uh, requirements as to who has the burden of proof. So that should make it a little more challenging for an employee to prove that um, the termination was due to a, uh, a poor act if, if in fact there is another, another viable reason why they were terminated. Um, we're seeing also that they're readopting, uh, providing opinion letters, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, that'll help us also for compliance with the Fair, Credit, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act. If we have some kind of funky situation, we can now ask for an opinion letter. Uh, ban the box efforts, we've, we've been talking about that for a number of years now. Uh, that's now been adopted by over 150 cities and counties nationwide. It's, um, but it has not been, uh, it is not a, either a statewide in Florida, for those of you in Florida, but it has not nationally been adopted. Um, once again, it doesn't necessarily require you to hire people with a criminal background, but it requires you to, first of all, conduct the background checks and later in the process, and as always, it requires you not to have a, um, not to disqualify people unless it's job related. Uh, for example, New York requires a fair chance process and temporary help firms have to follow. They have to follow a particular process before uh, withdrawing a conditional offer of employment based on criminal history. Uh, New Jersey, right next door, does not require a fair chance process. It's uh, very much state by state. Um, in terms of the EEOC, there was a recent lawsuit against a temporary help company, and that involved uh, a recruiter making a statement, that's the Diverse Links, Inc., where the recruiter made a statement to the candidate that they would, the company would not, the client would not be able to hire him or use him because he was born in 1945, and according to the client, age mattered. Well, we've been, as long as I've been in the industry, which is more than 25 years, that is always been a no-no, and we've always taught our recruiters and others in our, our offices to make sure that they were not discriminating on the basis of age or any other protected uh, class and that if a client did in fact want to discriminate, then we had to either correct the client and if they continued, then we had to walk away from the client. So this lawsuit is sort of surprising, but not. But not. It comes down to making, first of all, I think in this case, there was an assumption made by the recruiter uh, that age mattered. We're not certain that that really ever existed. You need to be making sure you've got a 
written policy that you've memorialized your prohibitions against employment discrimination um, and make making it an explicit statement about the importance of equal opportunity. You got to train your employees on how to answer and whether to use social media tools and how to use them and other online searches. And you know, train your employees to look for questionable phrasing on uh, phrasing on uh, job postings. Uh, seeking re recent college grads may be a problem. Uh, pregnancy discrimination, another hot growth area. You've got states like Connecticut and Massachusetts that are passing very progressive legislation that's expanding employment protections for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Um, and that has to do oftentimes with reasonable accommodations. Uh, and you know we've also passed the requirements regarding lactation policies and making lactation rooms available. Jumping on to what's recent and what we're going to see coming up, uh, we have this very interesting comp time bill that is happening. And that is using, uh, allowing private employers to use comp time versus cash for overtime. So that will be, it's already been passed in the House, and it will allow at the employee's, um, uh, the employee's choice whether they want to be paid cash or they want to accrue comp, comp time at one and a half hours for each hour of overtime. It's going to be a completely voluntary. Um, right now, the way it's written, it's completely voluntary. The employee would have to elect it in writing, and there is a big concern that's been in the discussion and the dicta around this bill about what voluntary really means. Um, and employees will be able to also change from accruing comp time to going back to receiving cash for overtime on 30 days' notice. Uh, this is not a free ride for employers because they will have to pay in cash for any unused comp time at the end of each year. Um, employees have to have worked at least 1,000 hours before they're qualified for this. So one of the big issues that we're concerned about is the record-keeping record issues with, um, you know, the in and out of time. Uh, and that is going to, uh, you know, present a new challenge for employers. Uh, right now, if the, if the House bill goes and gets passed by the Senate, then uh, they are anticipating their bill calls for this to be in place for five years and then to have to have it reauthorized uh, in order to continue. So that would be an interesting change for employers, but definitely not a free ride. Um, and once again, the employee would be able to change their mind at any time. Uh, they're getting a little firmer, which is a little bit different on protecting older workers against discrimination. Um, it would actually reverse a precedent from 2009 that um, proposed that a mixed motive standard was allowed and that's, you know, what was the real reason behind the termination? So we're waiting to see what's going to happen with that. Um, the Employee Rights Act has to do with the uh, requiring union members to give their permission for their dues to be used for any purpose other than collective bargaining. That would be an amendment to the National Labor Relations Act. And I think we're going to see some reinterpretation of the National Labor Relations Act. Those of you that are uh, um, are following that. Uh, I think it was as recently as yesterday that um, the new the new appointments came out, and there's some you know very positive positive feedback on that. We think there's going to be we're still looking at what's going to happen on an increase in the minimum wage. If it happens, it's going to be very uh, incremental. The uh, Democrats in Congress have introduced legislation that talked about incremental increases in the federal minimum wage that would top out at $15 an hour by 2024. 
um, we don't know what's going to happen with that yet. Uh, we do know that, for instance, some states are already reaching the $15 rate, like California. Well, uh, marijuana legalization continues to be a major challenge. It's because federally it remains illegal. Um, it's covered by the Controlled Substance Act. And we now have this dichotomy because many states are passing laws that allow uh, recreational and medicinal use. Um, the new Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, is staunchly opposed to marijuana. Um, we're not quite sure how he's going to move forward. He's talked about uh, dealing with some, of, some funding or some other way to try and penalize states that have liberal marijuana laws um, in order to try and bring them back to compliance with the federal law. Um, marijuana is a topic in and of itself and I think could, it certainly could warrant its own uh, presentation. Um, you have states that, that vary. In uh, some states prohibit employers from the even discrimination against an employee's use of medical marijuana. Uh, as long as they're in compliance with state laws, some expressly allow employers to maintain a drug-free workplace policy. Uh, some fail to address the employment relationship in any capacity. Um, however, most employers who have some form of drug-free workplace policy can, in fact, uh, preclude the use of marijuana and list it on its list of unacceptable drugs. If you're in fact interested in doing that, you have to have a, you know, consult counsel regarding your state law, but you also need to make sure that the definition of illegal drugs include marijuana um, or include all drugs that are covered by, use the federal uh, Controlled Substance Act as the measurement for what drugs are um, not permitted in your workplace. There are some states, by the way, that are starting to go to the issue of um, if, in fact, a person has, pro has a proper medical marijuana card, um, is that going to uh, fit within the requirement that you accommodate them under the uh, certainly under the ADA, uh, so far case law says no because the ADA is a federal law and marijuana is not permissible under federal law, but it does, um, it does actually come under some state laws that are now trying to require you to have to accommodate it under state law. And what's interesting is, for instance, in New York, there's been some discussion about the fact that if you have a medical marijuana user, even if you don't have to accommodate the marijuana that's implicating that the person has some underlying medical condition that you may have to uh, accommodate. So it's, it's uh, kind of an interesting area of the law that's going to continue to develop. Um, most states do not uh, require you to allow the use of marijuana in any form during the business day. There are some states that are starting to kind of slide away from that too. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to just mention to you about cybersecurity. It's scary. There was a big, uh, a big issue this week. A couple of major law firms, in fact, got shut down um, and were being held for ransom to get their, their um, they were completely out of business to get their data back. Uh, comes down to educating your employees. You need to be training them. You want to know what your state cyber attack laws are. But some of the things to think about is, um, you know, you're going to have a requirement for breach notification. So not only do you have to be worried about and you really want to look at what your cyber insurance policy covers you for, and I would make sure that you have, you're using a broker who understands it. But you also need to be concerned what the cyber policy is for the vendors that you're using. So if they are in possession of your infor of information, for instance, about your employees, 
uh, like protected information, you need to know how they're, how they're protecting it, and you want to know whether their insurance policy, if they have a breach, is going to protect you. So that's a really critical thing to look at as you're negotiating deals with your vendors. Um, you want to encrypt your, any data that you're transmitting. Uh, you may want to take payment processing out, out of, source it to a reputable vendor. Um, you really need to also educate your people to look at who's asking for information. I've had several issues now where a, uh, someone who purported to be an executive of the company, actually it was a phishing and got a, a payroll person at the company to send copies of all W-2s that were issued the preceding year. So you're going to have to educate your employees on cybersecurity and what to watch out for. Um, just in terms of general knowledge, um, you know, email and texting could be sanctioned form of communication if you allow them, you know, allow employees to text one another. Um, you need to be clear about what's going on in those texts, and there's no discrimination. Uh, you may want to save your old labor law posters because if you ever come into a past compliance question, you can prove that you had them up. Um, employee terminations, uh, it's a state-by-state -state issue. Make sure you know when your wages have to be paid on termination. There's been a number of suits about that. Um, State-level non-compete agreements, uh, under the Obama administration, we thought there was going to be some changes in non-competes that has not yet happened. You really need to be clear on what your state legislation is and whether or not it's limited and uh, how to move forward if you want to use non-competes. Uh, get them looked at in advance. So one final thought, and you know, I lo always love the saying, dances if no one is watching but you really have to email, text, and post as if you're going to have to explain it on the witness stand. So that's, a, that's kind of a key little final thought that you should share with all of your employees. Um, I want to thank you all for all you do for the American public in terms of employing people and putting them out to work. And here's what Dave has to say on the subject. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen this movie, it's a really fun movie to watch. So thank you all for everything you do for the industry. Whoops, and we lost Dave. Ah, can you take us back to Dave? Yes, let me try and take over here. Okay, it's all yours. Ah, there. Let's see if we can get it loud enough. Uh, I'm hoping you all can hear this and will enjoy it. Okay, so it looks like that was the end of that one. Um, that was. Go ahead Thank and, you. And great. I put up the contact information for both Diane and myself. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to go ahead and submit your questions um, into the Q&A or the chat feature, and we'll answer them as they come in. Diane, as we're waiting um, for questions to uh, come on into us, do you have any final thoughts or best practices, um, just some great takeaways that you may have 
um, for employers um, as they're dealing with some employment law issues? Um, let me give you a couple of thoughts. One, by the way, I only have one com at the end of my email address, so if you are trying to reach me, don't double up on the dot com. Um, I, I think that it's all about education. And the fact is that there's not that, even though we've seen the issues come out and they seem to be claiming that this is a new initiative on, for instance, background checks, it's really not a new initiative. You know, the staffing industry has been acting in that fashion all along. So it comes back to education, paying attention to what's going on, and making sure that your documents are all current and that you've reviewed them on a, you know, a regular basis, that you've reviewed your uh, agreements, that you've reviewed your um, employee descriptions and what their job descriptions are, and that you've trained all of the people that are out in the field so that they can, well, all of the people that are in your office, and that you've given criteria to the people that are in the field so that if they have a complaint, they know where to go. If it's handled on the front end, oftentimes it never gets to be where you're calling uh, an, an attorney and need to be represented. So Wonderful. if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, you have my email address. If you need me to send you the language that I mentioned as to the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, please just drop me an email and um, or drop me a question if you think of one later. Wonderful. Okay. So, again, if you would like uh, even a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, um, Diane would be happy to forward that to you. Um, so if you want to email her for that information, she'd be happy to send it. We will have a recording available on our website at tricom.com. Um, it's under our Industry Insider Resources tab. So if anyone uh, missed the presentation, you'd like to share it with other members um, of your office, feel free to do so. It should be available within the next couple of weeks. I'd like to thank all of our participants in today's webinar. Uh, and Diane, thank you for sharing your knowledge on employment law under the Trump administration. I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.